Good morning. Good morning, young scholars of Cedarville University. We are on the cusp of fall break. How do you feel about that? I have, uh, some of you know I have two students here, so can I just take a moment and give you some fatherly advice? Thank you. I was going to wait until you gave me an answer. All right, so you're driving. Don't use your phone while you're driving, please. All right. Don't drive tired. Don't drive tired. Make sure you got caffeine at the ready and make sure those, make sure those seat belts are snug around your waist. It's like a warm hug from your mother when you get home. All right. Take the Word of God with you. Take a copy of the Word of God with you. Um, and also, if you're willing to give a copy of the Word of God to an unbeliever while you're gone on fall break, Christian Ministries is making copies of the Bible available to you. You can stop by the Christian Ministries uh, lobby desk there, DMC 170, and pick up a copy before you leave uh, campus today. I'm excited about uh, introducing our uh, speaker to you today. I'm going to introduce him and pray, and we will get to worship. Our speaker today is uh, Andrew T. Walker. He serves as Director of Policy Studies for the Ethics and Religious Liberty Center. And uh, he is researching, speaking, and writing on a number of topics related to human dignity, family stability, religious liberty, public theology, and moral principles that support a civil society. Uh, he has written a book on marriage entitled Marriage Is, and he has recently published a book that I just finished last night called God and the Transgender Debate. I appreciate and applaud uh, Mr. Walker's willingness to take on the challenging topics. In reading this book, I realized that he is unashamed about presenting the truth of Scripture and unreserved in the charity that he demonstrates to those that are struggling in this area. I think you'll be blessed by what he has to say today, a lot of practical principles that will be helpful for us. Uh, would you bow with me this morning? Wait, wait, first, let's thank him for being here today. Now let's bow. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the grace that you bestowed upon us. We recognize in the great work of your Son our complete reliance upon you. We can stand righteous before you only because of his shed blood. We ask, Lord, for your grace upon us this day. I know many are facing midterms and projects due today. Help them as they seek to finish this first half of the semester well. Go with us, Lord. Those of us that are traveling this weekend, may you grant us safety on the roads. Help us to stay alert and be wise. Bless those that are going home to difficult situations, Lord. Pray that we might be able to have the conversations that you provide for us to those that need to know you and to be a blessing to our families. Lord, help us, like uh, Mr. Walker, to be salt and light in a culture that is in decay and in darkness. We ask that you would uh, allow us to honor you in what we say and do. Bless our time of worship together and the time of learning and teaching that follows. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, Cedarville. We as the chapel band introduced this song a few weeks ago, and I invite you to stand and sing, us, sing it with us again this morning. You are unfailing And we are more than conquerors Savior And in you our future is secure By your power We will not be shaken We will not be silent Sin is powerless Our God is for us We will not be broken Death is 
Hebrews 7, 25 says, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Let's celebrate this truth together as we continue to sing. Great to be with you all. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Cedarville and you're all's president and Dr. Thomas White. He is a real hero. Yeah, give him a round of applause. He's terrific. It is sincerely a great honor to be with you this morning talking about um, a lot of issues that um, make my Twitter mentions really, really popular sometimes. Talking about sexual ethics, talking about issues such as homosexuality and same-sex marriage, and then issues such as transgenderism, which, uh, as Dr. Mack mentioned, I uh, was able to write a book on that that released in August. But today, I, I, we're going to hit on those issues, but today, the main purpose of today's talk is to kind of offer a framework for how we ought to think about how God made us as 
male and female, and how God made us as sexual beings. So I've titled today's talk, In Whose Image? The Scandal of Christian Sexual Ethics in a Post-Christian Age. And this question of in whose image is absolutely central to figuring out what it means to be sexual beings, because we have to ask the question, are we made in the image of God, or are we just made in the image of man? Does man manufacture morality? Does man manufacture the order of reality? Or has something else happened that God gives us reality, that God makes us image bearers and imposes reality upon us and a moral order on us? So I have three main points and I'm gonna go ahead and give you them up front today. The first main point is that the Christian sexual ethic actually exists, that we actually have a word to offer the world around us. Secondly, that the Christian sexual ethic is a why, not just a what. So oftentimes we're told the content of what a Christian sexual ethic is, but we're not often told why that ethic exists or reasons why it exists or explanations for if you're asked, why do Christians believe what they believe around human embodiment, being made male or female or the definition of marriage, to offer an explanation for why, to give a defense. And then lastly, I want us to see that the Christian sexual ethic is evidence of God's common grace. That what God reveals to us in the scriptures about how he made us are not just sectarian ethics relevant only to Christians, but because God is the God of the universe and the God of humanity, that how he made humanity matters to how we act as sexual beings. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 26 through 28, a passage most of us are familiar with. Writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Moses writes, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so when we look at these first few passages in Genesis, what we see is that from Genesis 1 and 2, God is imposing order and design when he creates. God is not a God who creates out of chaos, but he creates according to purpose and to to, to a plan. But this also implies something crucial, that if God creates and God imposes, again, a moral order over the universe, it means that there are limits imposed on the universe. That means we cannot just, again, manufacture morality. We cannot manufacture reality. A part of being a Christian is to be, is to be uh, cognizant of how God has ordered and structured reality and to live inside of that reality and to ex- accept those limits of how he has made us. There's a, a philosopher named Thomas Sowell And he says, you can basically boil down humanity into two different camps of people. There are those who believe in a constrained vision of the universe, which means that there is a moral order, that there is a natural law to speak of. There's a law written on the heart, as Paul talks about in Romans 1. And that our job is to live in accordance with that moral order in that reality. And then alternately, there's what Thomas Sowell calls an unconstrained universe. And the unconstrained universe is a universe in which, again, morality is manufactured by man. That we are sovereign. We are the captain of our souls, to quote a famous poem. So it's a question of of what of what type of universe do we live in? Do we live in one that's constrained by natural limits, imposed by a God, for our good, or do we live in a chaotic universe where there's not order and meaning and structure and integrity knit into the universe? 
So we see that God imposes order on creation and he imposes order on humanity. That humanity is created by God with a definite nature and definite purpose. So, and all of this is in contrast to a a world in which we now live. Um, Very recently, I saw uh, an advertising campaign for uh, American Eagle. And when you're my age at 32, you don't shop at American Eagle anymore. So I just saw this from the outside. I didn't walk into it. I'm not cool enough for American Eagle anymore. And the marquee uh, advertisement said this, destroy rules, destroy limits. And it was apparently for an ad campaign for new jeans, and I don't know how buying jeans relates to destroying rules and destroying limits, uh, as though it's secular metaphysics, it's like skinny jeans and nihilism at bargain prices or something like that. (laughs) But I thought to myself, how silly is this no limits or destroy rules, destroy limits type argument? I mean, American Eagle doesn't really believe in destroying rules and destroying limits. I mean, if I walked into an American Eagle and decided that I was just going to shoplift some jeans, uh, I bet there's a rule against that. I bet there's a limit uh, of what they would allow me to do inside that store. And so there's inconsistency here. So when you think about it, the destroy rules and destroy limits approach, it's the air that we breathe in our society. We live in a world in which we were taught that the universe is kind of malleable and, and plastic. That we can bend reality or conform reality to our will rather than conforming our will to reality. And one of the areas we see this happening most vividly in the culture today is over the issues pertaining to sexuality. Humanity thinks that, again, we are sovereign in our sexual desires and that no one can say don't do X, Y, or Z and that the only kind of moral constraints governing our current sexual ethic in society is the notion of consent. That if there's two consenting adults, that's fine. But that's, that's not what the Bible is saying about the nature of how God made us. Consent is not the baseline ethic of a, of a proper sexual ethic. We see this particularly um, around issues such as the definition of marriage. Is marriage something that is given to us, imposed on the moral order by virtue of us being male and female? Or can marriage be redefined so that marriage no longer has kind of that complementary baseline understanding to its definition? It's a question. Is marriage really real? And I would say, when you look at the scriptures, much like you have uh, with water, you have H2O. If you take away one of those oxygen atoms, you you, you cease to have water. And if you take away the complementarity of marriage, you no longer have marriage. You have just emotionally intense relationships where people live together and share benefits, but it's not marriage. And then, most poignantly today, that's coming at us at 90 miles an hour is the transgender revolution. It's it's asking the question, if a man wants to identify as a woman, who are we as society to say no? That, That presupposes that a man who identifies as a woman can actually be a woman. And I'll argue further down that that is not, uh, we cannot accept or countenance that from a Christian sexual ethic, but I'll get there in a few minutes. So the Christian worldview challenges all of the above ideas and because Christianity teaches that there are limits, that reality is not endlessly malleable and subject just to our preferences or desires. And more importantly, and, and I'm gonna get to this later on, is that when we exceed those limits and exceed those constraints that God has imposed on us, we actually do damage to ourselves and damage to society. So one of the first main points is that I want to say today that the Christian sexual ethic actually exists. And when I say sex, what I'm saying by that is sex as in the way our bodies were created as male and female, and sex in the way our bodies fit together as male and female in the context of marriage. But So when we look to Genesis, we see kind of what I'm calling a, an, an anthropology or a blueprint or a map to how God made us and what this sexual ethic really is. And really uh, three quick truths. 
about this anthropology is that God created humanity in his image. Number one, this, this is the source of our dignity. It's a gift that God has given us because we are made by him. We are endowed with dignity that we cannot take away from each other or governments cannot deny from one another or take away from someone. That if you are a human being, you bear God's image and you have dignity. But we also see that he made humanity in male and female forms. And this is so important because what we see in making humanity in male and female forms is that there's a fixed and objectively known understanding of what it means to be a male and a female. That God actually makes a male a male and a female a female. And that this can be known. That God has not kept who we are a mystery from us. That God actually creates us and says who we are in the very opening pages of Genesis. And that in making us male and female, he made us differentiated. A part of the research in my book, I, I, I marveled at this. I had opportunities to think about how the, the manifold ways in which God made us different. That God made us so different down to the level of our chromosomes. Think about that. That we're not just different anatomically, reproductively, physiologically, or emotionally. We are different in all of those capacities, but God knit that difference down to the level of chromosomes. And then one other aspect of this blueprint is that he made male and female for one another. This is where we get this understanding of of biblical complementarity, that men are made for women and women are made for men. And in this divine mystery we read later on in Ephesians chapter five, somehow that complementarity in the context of marriage reveals the mystery of the gospel. But the main point is that the Christian ethic presumes that there is an ethic to begin with. And this is distinct from a sexual, sexu, uh, secular ethic which not only disagrees with a Christian ethic but rejects it because the secular sexual ethic teaches that there's no binding ethic that really exists. That all sexual morality is simply a matter of our autonomy and our choices and our preferences. The second main point for today is that the Christian sexual ethic is a why, not just a what. It's a why, not just a what. So if I were to ask, why ought couples not have sex outside of marriage? Or why is marriage something that cannot be, re- be redefined? Or why did God make us men or women? Or why is it impossible for a man who identifies as a woman to actually be a woman? If a non-believer were to ask you those questions, would you be able to answer them? Would you have a good answer grounded in reason and in sound argument? Now, we have the, we have the Bible as our authority and as our highest authority, the norming norm to channel our uh, reformational roots that we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of this year. But we need to have answers for, for why we believe what we believe, not just what we believe. Um, a few weeks ago, I was in Florida uh, delivering some talks uh, on issues related to this, and I had a teacher pull me aside, and she looked at me very innocently, and she, she thanked me for kind of logically and rationally walking through why it is Christians believe what we do about sexuality and not just what we believe. And this, uh, honestly, it, it broke my heart because it revealed to me that for the first time in this young teacher's life, uh, she had been given a reason or a justification for why she believes what she believes, not just what she believes. This teacher had somehow bought into the idea that Christian sexual ethics are irrational and exist just because the Bible says so. Now please hear me, our ethics do exist because the Bible says so, but that's because the Bible paints a portrait of creation as something ordained by God. 
That creation has design, integrity, and order to it. And that the Christian sexual ethic is not just biblical, but a part of creation and general revelation. So that when we look at creation, and when we look at how we have been made male and female, we ought to be able to give uh, answers and explanations for why we believe what we believe, because the Bible and, and, and creation, special revelation and general revelation, they travel together. And because this is so, so pivotal, I want us to see that the Bible is a story not just about what it means to be a Christian, but about what it means to be truly human as well. And this failure to understand why we believe what we believe and not just, not just what we believe around sexual ethics is one of our greatest lapses and failures in 21st century American Christianity. And I would actually argue it's one of the primary reasons that the Christian sexual ethic has collapsed in the culture. The secular culture knows why it believes what it believes. Christians have often been unable to articulate why it is we believe what we believe. So that when challenges to the definition of marriage are put forward, Sometimes all we are left with is quoting a Bible verse. And I want us to quote Bible verses. Please do not hear me denigrating or devaluing the role of the Bible. But when we understand what the Bible is saying and doing and making us male and female, we actually have the intellectual resources to provide sound, logical arguments that, says, that, that show marriage, Christian marriage, to be relevant and applicable to the whole world. And I mean, you might be like me. I, I grew up in a wonderful church in central Illinois. In fact, uh, Dr. Dan DeWitt, who's sitting here in the front row, is one of my close friends, and we actually grew up in the same town in Jacksonville, Illinois. And as great as my church was growing up, um, I don't recall receiving any teaching ever about the nature of biblical complementarity, the nature of what it means to be a male and a female. Why marriage is something that's timeless and universal, that it's not, just, it's not just something that we hold irrationally or arbitrarily. So one of, the, one of the great things about the age in which we're living right now is be, that the culture is no longer pretending to be Christian, and it's forcing us, we're kind of on our heels right now, we're, we're backed up with our, against a wall, but it's forcing us for the first time to have to do some really, really hard work in investigating why it is we believe what we believe, and not just what we believe. Because if we cannot give an answer, we will fail to offer any positive witness. And trust me, Christians will simply wither away at the face of cultural pressure. If you can't give an answer for why you believe what you believe around marriage and gender, chances are you're going to wither away at the mounting cultural pressure coming in upon us. We've been compromised because we've been taught how to feel more often than we've been taught how to think and respond. Because there's often poll-tested language like love is love or love wins that's a lot easier to talk about in the culture than talking about abstract, sometimes difficult concepts such as biblical complementarity. But like it or not, the witness of how Christians order ourselves and our sexual morality is one of the dominant witnesses we give to society. It has, it has been so from the very beginning of the early church. Uh, one of the gifts that the church has given Western society are concepts like monogamy and chastity. Show me where, prior to Christianity, the virtues of monogamy and chastity were on the world's stage. They simply were not. Christianity comes along and says, no, God made men and women for each other and for one another, exclusively for one another, in a permanent relationship. And it trains our desires to want to enter biblical marriages that glorify God. So that question of how we live our lives as Christians, it's gonna ultimately drive to that question of why. And so let's answer that question, why ultimately? And the answer to that is that Christian sexual ethics are grounded in creation and reaffirmed in the gospel. Christian sexual ethics are grounded in creation and reaffirmed in the gospel. 
And what I mean by that is we don't have ethics because of the gospel. We have ethics rooted in a divinely ordered creation that the gospel reaffirms. That the resurrection is God's reaffirmation that the creation that he began in Genesis 1 and 2 remains good despite still being in a sinful world and sinful bodies. But creation is good. It's broken, but it's still good. I want to say it one more time. We don't have ethics because of the gospel. We have ethics rooted in a divinely ordered creation that the gospel affirms. And even more so, and this gets to the question of of why we care about sexual ethics as a a witness in society, is that the Christian sexual ethic is beautiful, freeing, and produces human and cultural flourishing. We believe that Christian sexual ethics reveal that our bodies have a design and a purpose. You think back to Genesis, and I talked about this biblical anthropology, and uh, I like to talk about Genesis 1 and 2 kind of being uh, a, a blueprint for how God has ordered the cosmos. And in much in the same way, you think about an airplane for a second. An airplane has a blueprint for its design, and every part of the plane has a design for a particular purpose. The blueprint exists in order to help us fly an insanely heavy object at high rates of speed. Each part of the plane is relying on other parts of the plane to do their job so it can do its job and so that the parts of the plane are all interlinked and dependent so they can go about a task, which is flight. So every part of the plane's design is intentional and nothing in a blueprint happens by accident or guesswork. And so when we look at Genesis in the same way, when we look at the blueprint offered there, we see that God's act of creating was intentional in every part. That Genesis 1 and 2 shows us that the God of the Bible, again, he does not create according to chaos, but according to a design and a purpose. It's a creation he calls very good. It's, it's not a creation he just calls average. Could you imagine if he just said, God looked at all that he created and said, hmm, that's average. No, he says it's very good meaning that his creation is teeming with brilliance and order and beauty. And then at the climax of creation, humanity is brought into the picture. And there's something unique about humanity, unlike the rest of his creation, that humans can relate to God and know God in ways that the rest of creation does not. I mean, think about it. Rabbits do not debate the existence of God. Fish do not think about self-transcendence and the meaning of life. But we do, because God has made us to relate to him in ways that the rest of creation does not. But then what is is God doing in Genesis in making humanity? He's assigning us a task. He's giving us a purpose. And he says that humans were assigned the task to subdue creation, which means to rule God's creation on his behalf so that we are part of God's creation and so that we are creatures with a creator. And there's a huge implication for this, that the Christian sexual ethic embraces the givenness of creation and that the best way to live is according to the blueprint that God designed and by acting the part that God designed humanity to perform. That the God who creates is the God who assigns to humans what humans are, what humans are supposed to do, and how humans are supposed to do it. And that being creatures means that our highest calling and our greatest pleasure is found living in line with how God has designed us. This means that we cannot simply rewrite the blueprint. We can't tear it apart and recreate the blueprint. Because God is the sovereign Lord in that blueprint. Again, he calls his creation very good. And this is important for when we think about sex and gender, because when God declared his creation good, he was declaring that what he has made has purpose behind it. Now, I'm an ethicist by training. and In ethics, there's a branch of ethics called teleological ethics. That's what, if you come away with anything today, that's what you can tell your mom and dad when they call you. What did you learn at chapel today? You learned about teleological ethics. And teleological ethics are simply a fancy way of communicating that We have a purpose and a goal for for anything that we do. What is the goal or purpose? Think about this. None of us build anything 
without there being a purpose to the thing being built. A builder doesn't build a house for the house to remain unoccupied. Now the purpose of creating something is is use for some further end and our design reflects our image and our image reflects God's purpose for us. Now this is not to say that how God designed us is the easiest or the most popular way to live right now because we live in a world and in a universe ravaged by sin. So sometimes the Christian sexual ethic is going to look challenging. It's going to be challenging. But it remains. It cannot simply be torn apart and reinvented. That being creatures means that we cannot recreate ourselves in any fashion or form that we desire by a simple act of the will or the simple work of a surgeon. That when we as creatures reject the creator's blueprint, we are both rebelling against the natural order of how things objectively are and we are rejecting the life that is going to be the highest good for us. And when we look at maleness and femaleness in particular, what we see in scriptures is that they aren't artificial categories, that the differences between men and women reflect the creative intention of being made in God's image, that we're different. And our, our difference, again, it extends down to our chromosomes, our brains, our, our voices, our body shapes, our body strengths, and our reproductive systems. And this principle alone means the ideological premises of the transgender debate are simply false. You cannot re-engineer chromosomes. I mean this with all compassion and sympathy, but we cannot simply simply be what we want to identify as. We have to ask, how did God make us? And we cannot re-engineer chromosomes. And so again, the purpose of our bodies is connected to the difference of our biological sex and that what we see is that a male and female bear a purpose towards a one flesh union that makes them able to unite and able to reproduce and that this complementarity of Adam and Eve is what makes their marriage union real. And that the most basic element of marriage is the physical difference that exists between men and women. And this means same-sex marriage is, is unintelligible according to the Bible. Governments can issue licenses calling forth same-sex marriages, but that doesn't mean same-sex marriages really metaphysically exist. Again, we have to ask ourselves, who, who, who has authority on this issue? What order are we going to choose to live within? The constrained order, where God reveals himself in the scriptures, or an unconstrained order where we manufacture our own morality? So that when we look at Genesis 1 and 2, what we see from God making us male and female is that our bodies are designed, what our, de- what our bodies are designed for and destined for are different as male and female. How our bodies are designed bear witness to the difference that reflects God's will for humanity. And to misunderstand, blur, or reject the creator's categories for humanity doesn't just put us in rebellion against the, crea- the creator, it puts us at odds with how each one of us was made. And so we want to get this blueprint right. And one of the ways we love our neighbor and we love our society is by insisting on having the right blueprint. But why does this difference between male and female matter? Again, because we were made to complement each other in order to fulfill our God-given task in this world, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Again, this is, this is connected to God's kind of cultural mandate that from the male and female spring forth civilization, the advancement of culture. And so critically, what we see later on in the New Testament is that Jesus affirms this design and purpose. In Matthew 19, he says, Jesus is repeating the pattern for how God designed man and woman when he says, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So that Jesus is saying in his ministry, amidst the kingdom being present in Jesus, that what we see in Genesis 1 and 2 is still binding. 
And then further on in the New Testament, we see that the Christian sexual ethic is meant to glorify God by reflecting the truth of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20 says this, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So what Paul is saying here, he's saying we practice sexual holiness and reverence for how God has made us because to betray God's design over us and in us is to betray his lordship and the price he paid to redeem us. I want us to see so critically that our our sexual ethics are not just arbitrary rules or propositions, but instead they are grounded in creation, in the mystery of God acting in creation. That our sexual ethics reveal a design in the path of human flourishing and our discipleship, according to Paul. So this means that the call on our lives as men and women, as made in the image of God, is summed up in the image of God as perfected in Christ. That God made us men and women that we might become more like Jesus Christ, according to Paul. That God made marriage that humans might flourish and that the world would be given an earthly representation of the wonder and mystery of the gospel. But the Christian sexual ethic is infused by a gospel ethic. Paul says, now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Notice here, Paul unites the themes of redemption, resurrection and sanctification all together that the power that raised Christ according to Paul is the power that enables us to live lives of sexual holiness that again the gospel affirms or ratifies the sexual ethics of Genesis that the gospel explains that we are not our own that we are to glorify and honor God in our bodies because he purchased our bodies for a price and that price was his own son so that the gospel enables followers of Jesus to live in obedience with how God made us to image him. And the gospel provides the power to live in accord with the way that God has made us. But again, crucially, the the, the ethical norms of the Christian sexual ethic are embedded in creation itself, so that the resurrection is, again, the reaffirmation that God's creation has purpose, integrity, and that creation remains good despite sin. And lastly, I wanna talk about the Christian sexual ethic being evidence of God's common grace. That when we look out upon the world that we live in, most of the social injustices that mark our age are marked as a result of the misuse of our bodies and the misuse of our sexual desires from issues of pornography, which is a a form of human sex trafficking, objectifying men and women, transgenderism, abusing women sexually. I've been blown away at this Me Too campaign we've seen been seeing on social media, declining marriage rates, single parenting, child sex abuse, abortion, divorce, adultery, all of these are the result of us distancing ourselves from the Christian sexual ethic. And, And there's so much concern for social justice in evangelical circles, and rightly so. We believe in a God of justice, and yet at the exact point where so much cultural and social injustice is happening, the church too often stays silent out of embarrassment for what, the, for what we believe about how God has made us as male and female. But again, the Bible doesn't just teach us about what it means to be better Christians. 
It teaches us about what it means to be truly human because God is the God of all creation. What we need to see is that there's so much cultural and personal hurt due to sexual sin. And and maybe, let me just propose this, maybe the church should see its sexual ethics and what we have to offer the world as a gift of common grace to this world. Our ethics are not irrelevant. When, When properly explained and understood for why God made us, they result in cultural and human flourishing. I promise you. Where there are cultures where there is less divorce and less pornography, you will have a happier, healthier healthier culture. Unless we as Christians are willing to speak the truth in love, then we are, we are failing to live up to the mission that God has called us. A famous theologian, Carl Henry, said this, if the church fails to apply the central truths of Christianity to social problems correctly, someone else will do so incorrectly. And that incorrect ethic is wreaking havoc across this world. So the scandal of the Christian sexual ethic is that there is a Christian sexual ethic and that that it dares to offer a better, truer, and more beautiful explanation for the world than what secularism or progressivism could ever hope to offer. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you have not left us to our own brokenness and our own sin, but Lord, in your gospel, in your word, you have, you have spoken to us that you are not silent. Father, that you're, you are a father who loves us and loves his creation So Lord, I pray that you would instill in all of these students a passion for your supremacy and how you have made the world and how you have made us as male and female. Lord, give them courage to stand strong in an age where there is no benefit culturally to standing and believing and preaching what we believe on these issues. But Lord, give them a fervent passion for seeing what you have revealed to us as male and female as a way that we love our world and love our culture and as evidence of your common grace. And Father, as they depart for fall break, give them safe travels and warm fellowship with families and bring them back safely for the rest of the semester. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen.